So we may be jumping into some of those examples um, in our conversation. But first, I just want to introduce our presenters. We're incredibly fortunate to have them. Um, first up, uh, uh, Allison Bell and Leslie Harris, who run Quant, Quant Farms in Watley, Massachusetts. Um, they were originally concerned when beavers first arrived at Quant Quant Farms in 2013 because the beavers began removing trees and flooding their blueberry patches. However, they have since embraced the beavers and helped them make a safe home on their farm. Dallas May stewards the May Ranch in southeastern Colorado. His conservation work and ethic brought him the 2021 Colorado Aldo Leopold Conservation Award. He serves on several boards associated with water issues, prioritizing the protection of water rights for his community. And John Griggs, since 1991, John has been the ranch manager for Maggie Creek Ranch in Elko, Nevada, a beef cattle operation running on public and private land in the high desert of northeastern Nevada. Maggie Creek is honored frequently for their conservation work, including winning the 2015 National Environmental Stewardship Award. Besides ranch work, John is the immediate past president of the Nevada, Nevada Cattlemen's Association and is currently chairman of the board of the trustees for the Western Folklife Center. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Allison and Leslie. Thanks, Adam. What is your, I think we have to share our screen. Is that where we're going next? I think so, yep. I think you have to give us the permission to do that. Sure, one moment. There we go, that should yeah. work. All right. Can you all see that okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, well, uh, my name is Allison and this is Leslie. Uh, we we are both part of Quan Quan Farm in Waitley, Massachusetts. You want to do the advance? Sure. Um, go ahead. I thought I would start just, just with a little map here of where we are since we seem to have people from all over the place, which is really kind of cool. We're in Massachusetts on the east coast of the United States. Down in the lower left-hand corner, you can see uh, Massachusetts surrounded by five other states there. And that uh, red pin is where we are in, in western Massachusetts. We're right on the Connecticut River, um, just a couple miles from the Connecticut River. And you can see in the bigger map, the Connecticut River is on the on the right-hand side of the picture. The red dot in the in the left center is where our farm is. This is a Google map. It's it's kind of cruddy, but it does show the mix of land use that we have here. You can see farmland in the floodplain along the Connecticut River. Um, and then as you move west or left in the map, you can see we get into um, kind of mixed use land and a lot of forest and some swamp. So we're we're very fortunate living here that we have a whole mix of different kinds of habitat around us, which um, lets us enjoy um, many different kinds of wildlife species. Go ahead. So in about three months, uh, this is what our farm will look like. This is a, a drone photo taken in May. Um, Leslie, do you want to describe the farm? Sure. So Quonquan Farm has been farmed since before the colonists arrived, right? And, but it has been named Quonquan Farm um, since the 20s. 1920s. 1920s. And you can see here that there is a small apple orchard. There are about two and a half acres of blueberries. Up here where you can't really see them are is a peach orchard, um, a farm store, a couple of residences. And then this is a barn that is now used um, for weddings and other events. We also have a pick your own flower garden. And this photograph was taken before we started growing no-till vegetable crops as well. So we're a diversified farm, but we primarily earn our income through pick your own fruit and events. And this is, a, this is a photograph that looks down on our blueberry patches. So that's those there. And Allison's going to explain the waterways. Uh, this, is, this is focusing in on our, right, our waterways. Uh, we are, even though we're just two miles from a very large river, we are 
kind of at the headwaters of two very small streams. You can see in the upper right, that's our farm pond. That's a, a wetland area that uh, 100 years ago, I think they enhanced to make a, a proper pond out of. It's spring fed and from that pond, there drains a very small uh, stream. And then there's a the second smaller stream coming right down through the center that joined together and flow down and eventually into the Connecticut River. And this photo was taken just a couple of years ago. Um, and what you see in here are a whole series of larger and smaller um, flooded areas made by the beavers. I added this photo from 1938. This was taken off the roof of one of the, one of the barns looking uphill from um, the center of our farm. But I, I think this is really interesting because it shows us what the landscape looked like a hundred years ago here. Um, basically the property that belongs to our farm was essentially treeless. They were growing uh, dairy cow, they were raising dairy cows here. And I don't see, if, if they had been allowed, I don't see any opportunities for beavers to have been here at, at that point. You gotta remember that um, the Connecticut River was one of the primary access points for Dutch explorers for almost 400 years ago, um, looking for routes for the fur trade. And so they were trading in beaver skins here at least 350 years ago. And it didn't take very long for the beavers here in Massachusetts to be completely eradicated. And I would think that on this farm property, the way that it has been managed, that until about 12 years ago, there hadn't been a beaver here since then. But in 2012, um, I, I was astounded to find down along this small little brook, we call it the Dingle Brook, evidence that beavers had arrived and were starting to build a dam. And in very short order, they had built a pretty considerable dam. Um, it was, it happened to be on our property line and in a place where it was not causing any problems. Um, and, uh, just the amount of effort that two or three beavers had put into this was super impressive. And I, frankly, I was quite delighted that they had come. Go ahead. Um, that, that winter, this is the lodge that they, very small lodge, but they did have, um, their first litter of kits here in 2014, and they've been having litters ever since. We've been really privileged to watch several generations of beavers come and go. There was some concern, you can take over. Um, there was some concern, of course, when they arrived in the fall when they started their lumbering projects. For most of the, for most of the season, they seem here to depend on uh, herbaceous, leafy, green material for food, not so much in the uh, lumberjack business, but certainly in the fall, they got started taking down a lot of trees. And, and we do have a lot of trees. And some people here were very concerned that we were going to end up completely denuded. That, that wasn't the case, but it was a concern. And then one of the concerns that I had to face as the farm manager, it's one thing if they are, you know, we're a 200 acre farm and we only farm we only actually have about 10 of those acres in agriculture. The rest is in meadows and upland forest and some wetland. So when they sort of concentrated around our agricultural crops, it was a little frustrating because what they did was they clogged this culvert, which used to just be a little stream. And one of the results of that was that they were flooding my blueberry patches. So these are blueberry bushes in a row and the row now ends in water. And some of the bushes were underwater, which you know, it's not the end of the world to lose a bush and high, uh, high bush blueberries are a native plant in Massachusetts and they like a, a wetter environment. So none of these things were gonna, you know, spell the end of my blueberries, but it did make it really hard to try to work in the blueberries. So to get your mower around the end or to get the mulch wagon around the end and just to even, make it safe for the pick your own customers and their little children to get in there without running into trouble. 
Um, I was really concerned also that this pond would just keep growing and growing. It, it was, they were going to stop here. <laughs> it was getting deeper right. by the day. <laughs> so it really became an issue of I can't lose more of my, I'm willing to share some things, but I can't lose the entire field to, to a beaver pond. So that was our first encounter with um, Beaver Solutions and the Beaver Institute. So this is uh, Mike who's the founder of the Beaver Institute. He's on the left and he's working with an assistant and they're installing the first of our um, Beaver flow device, flow management devices in that first dam that showed up in a culvert. And it was a miracle. This thing continues to work today, continues to control the level of that pond to a point that's acceptable to me as the person who farms this area. And It'll, and it gives us something to show our customers and talk to them about and explain how we're living with these beavers. Because I will tell you, when that dam first appeared, we started to remove it by hand. And no matter how hard you work, you are never working as hard as a beaver because <laughs> they're coming in at night and they're just working all night and they are way more motivated than we are. So we decided that um, we would take advantage of a program that the Massachusetts SPCA and a grant making donor have to help agricultural institutions and um, towns, municipal governments in the state of Massachusetts to install beaver flow devices to manage them mm -hmm. humanely. What, what this does too is that it, it works for us in that it lowered this water level and keeps it at a constant level that's predictable. But it, we we could choose how much we could lower the water level, and it, we left enough water in this this little tributary system so that the beaver still had the ability to move back and forth between uh, different different areas that they wanted for feeding and for access. And then in 2018, they built another dam in the same blueberry patch and flooded it again, and um, so we called. Mike again, and had him come in and install a second flow device that helped to reduce um, the water level in this one. And um, to this day, we're able to work in our blueberry patches successfully. So this is um, a picture in our apple orchard. And one of the things we learned about beavers is that beavers love apples, love them. They will make a an excursion over land to get to the apples. And for many years, we just watched them. They would come out even while our apple pickers were out picking apples. They would come out and out of the pond and across up the hill and across the road and into the orchard, get an apple, sort of hold it and waddle back down to the pond. And they were they would do that in broad daylight if they were uh, let the less shy beavers. And we found that very charming <laughs> until- I still find that charming. And they never took down a tree. Um, and then they started to take off. We had a rogue beaver come in. He was a newer beaver. Um, and he came in and started going up to the apple orchard and did not cut down. He only cut down one of my um, baby trees, but he did take what are probably close to 50 year old scaffold limbs off the bottoms of my trees. Those are great, big, long, important um, branches to our trees. And he was getting in there and he was doing about one a night off of the trees along the road. So um, Allison, well, I would come to Allison and say, hey, your beavers are crossing out <laughs> my apple orchard. And Allison would do everything she could to make it so that I wasn't, uh, you know, I'm never going to inflict harm on a beaver. I think they're wonderful creatures, but it sure made me throw my hat on the ground a couple of times. Well, we we, 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 ended we, ended up putting, we put it up some fancy to try to yeah. discourage them. And, so, they, and that they, seemed to work. They were, they well, it worked once or, and then they would walk all the way around it. I was surprised at how much, risk they were willing to take on land to try to get to um, these treats in our orchard. Um, one of the benefits that the beavers brought to our farm is this is a drone photograph of our farm taken in 2022. And we had a terrible drought. I don't think we got, and I keep track of the rainfall, which is not something I normally have to do. Um, I kept track of the rainfall that year and we did not get measurable rainfall between April and August or October, it, it didn't matter. We didn't get rainfall. We normally get an inch a week is a reasonable amount of rainfall for us. Um, and we're growing fruit, tree fruit, perennial tree fruit. So we're not, and it's not irrigated. 
our blueberry patches are not, not irrigated and our lawns, uh, our lawns and, and our, our peaches <laughs> and our fields, the flowers and the vegetables, which you can see in the um, sort of right middle side, the colorful stripes there, those are irrigated. Um, but the rest of this is not. But one of the things that was noticeable when we looked at this photograph was <clears throat> the apple orchard is in the upper left-hand corner. And the only thing green in that apple orchard was the foliage on the trees. And if you look closely, the trees are choking and dropping their apples and their foliage. And the grass is just as brown as could be. Same thing was happening on our peach orchard, which is out of sight here. But the blueberry patch, which is nearest that pond system where the um, beavers are, the water table was raised there enough that we lost very little of our blueberry crop to that drought. It was amazing that you could go down there and the, the soil would still be reasonably moist. It wasn't the hard pan dry um, soil that ever, was every place else on the farm. I can hear I can hear the peop, the Western people kind of snickering about our drought, but you have to remember <laughs> that that the reason it's such a problem for us is that all of our flora and our crops are adapted to, to a certain a to an inch rain a week or forty inches of rain a year, and when that is disrupted, it's it's quite uh, chaos and and damaging for us. So. Some of the other benefits of 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 having the beavers uh, here at the farm that that uh, I'm I'm quite proud of they they because we're out many people are out every day in close proximity to these waterways and their lodges and their ponds um, they get quite used to us and actually recognize individuals they certainly recognize me and they recognize Leslie. Um, and will tolerate us being close to them. Um, we've had several generations of beavers now. Some some have been more more curious than others, um, but it it allows um, for some great photography. And it didn't take long to turn um, this relationship into uh, a great social media fodder. Our Facebook page is full of uh, beaver photos and 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 stories about beavers. And I'm pretty big into wildlife cameras. And um, as soon as that first dam, this is that first dam, was built, uh, put up a wildlife camera right on that dam, which I hadn't appreciated before what an active, um, cool place that is for a wildlife camera, what an intersection of habitats and transportation routes it is. So between... Uh, the uh, on the ground photography and the wildlife cameras, we have captured lots of stories about beaver families. Go ahead. And of course, all the different uh, habitat, uh, wildlife diversity that that has brought in from insects. Uh, we have seven species of breeding frogs here, all the wetland birds, and then the, the larger mammal species, including otter families that come and go is, is super exciting and interesting. It's given us a, a chance to observe the beavers daily uh, throughout the year and notice and learn about their food choices, that they are, are have very specific eating habits month by month by month through the year. Uh, this is a young beaver eating a sensitive fern. Uh, this came, this, this was a, a great boon to us because the farm pond had become quite choked with these small lily pads. And this farm pond is one that we use um, to let our dogs swim in, for example. And when the beavers arrived, they you can see the mud in the lower right-hand corner there. They raised the level of the farm pond and then the, the big male beaver proceeded to eat every single water lily in the pond. And today the pond is completely free of those water lilies. And I never thought I would see that happen. I was beside myself trying to figure out how to clear out the pond. And then just to, just to end, uh, sort of in a, a full circle kind of beavers and agriculture, this is more agriculture and beavers here. Uh, we've really come to notice that beavers themselves are farming our property. They are controlling and manipulating the vegetation to their advantage. They are removing um, old old trees that shade uh, the banks so that it will favor new successional uh, flora. They 
We have willows and dogwoods here that they actively manage. This is a willow patch that obviously they've just kind of uh, cut down. But they, we have willow patches that are, they've been cutting down for 12 years now. Every two or three years, they will come through and cut it. And then um, the, the new growth uh, will refresh itself. Uh, Leslie appreciates this because we have these sort of ditches in between our blueberry blocks and the beavers keep these free of, of uh, tall woody growth that shades the crop. We used to have to go in and cut all this by hand. So the beavers now the beavers do it for us. us. So that's, that's, uh, that's what we'll stop right now with. Uh, this is one of our winter beavers uh, and uh, we're happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, um, Allison and Leslie. Just a real few quick questions before we move on. We had someone ask, um, did you use woven wire fence or electric fence for the apple tree trees? And if woven wire, have you considered electric fences? We have a lot of electric fences that um, we use. We have electric net fence that we use for our, uh, we have pastured laying hens and <clears throat> we use those. Um, and we had one that was sort of broken sort of ripped up past our ability to repair it. And we used that partly to stop the beavers. And then we had just a bunch of scrap metal fence around. We didn't really see, we were afraid beavers would tear up the um, more the good fence. <laughs> so we just used scrap fence that we had laying around because we used pieces of fence to protect um, small trees and that sort of thing from deer. So, but we didn't electrify anything. We did not electrify anything. No. We didn't really feel like that was it, necessary. It was more of a, a physical barrier, and it doesn't have to be a very tall fence to stop yeah. a beaver or discourage they're a not, beaver. They're not going to jump they're in. They're not good. They're not really great pole vaulters. But the other piece of that is, is it also had to be up for all the way through the winter because they were coming up in the fall and in the winter. And we get enough snow here that we didn't want to leave good electric net out in the snow. And then finally, before we, we move on to Dallas, one, one more question for you all. Uh, did you need to protect your blueberry bushes from being pruned by the beavers? You know, it's funny because they, just like they ignored the apple trees for a long time. Um, and I don't know if this was the same sort of rogue new beaver that came in and took down, took the branches off my apple trees, or if it's young beavers doing this, but they've been, they did start going into my blueberry patch last year and cutting them. The good news is we have to prune our blueberry patch every year. We're already cutting these things out every year. You know, so I noticed going in this year that there was less encroachment from beavers, um, but they did do some pruning in there. And I just wish they, I could give them a sort of talking to about how I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> style. <laughs> style. The style points. Right. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, and it's not, again, in a blueberry Bush, you could go in with a chainsaw and you have in two years, you have a producing blueberry bush again. I mean, the nice thing about a blueberry bush is it's unlike an apple tree, very forgiving when it's mispruned. And they don't seem really particularly fond of eating no. them. Which makes me think it's a young beaver who just kind yeah. of doing something for something to chew. Something to chew. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, we'll loop you both back in when we open up the conversation between and amongst all of us. But now I want to hand the mic over to, to Dallas May. Dallas. Thank you, Adam. Um, my apologies to everybody. I did not prepare any video or photos. So I, I'm sure you can see the photo behind me is basically the wetlands representation of what we have. I farm and ranch with my family and blessed to be able to have my three grown children, my six grandchildren. My mother is still part of our operation. She's 89 years old. So we're a family operation. We farm and ranch on the Eastern Plains of Colorado. Uh, we raise alfalfa and corn. We sell to dairies. So we have a commercial ag production and we also have a, a natural grass ranch that is still native grass, native prairie that has never been converted, never been plowed. It's still all native grass. So the privilege we have of that is that we have seven miles of Big Sandy Creek that dissects our ranch. It goes through the middle of it. We have a, a lot of wetlands. We have a lot of emer emergent wetlands that are connected. And with that, we have a big network of beaver. Um, beaver ponds just Everything that we have in the alluvial of the Creek Valley is um, thanks in large part to the beaver. On the north end of our property, as Sand Creek enters our property, 
it's about a 200 mile stretch of stream that comes from the front range of Colorado by Colorado Springs or Black Forest and drains southeastern Colorado, enters the Arkansas River at our south property edge. So that creek used to be perennially flowing, always had surface flow. And as development has happened in Colorado, that has became not only ephemeral, but basically has been reduced to just a few places of standing water. But once it reaches, reaches our north boundary, surface flows begin. And I attribute that to the presence of beaver dams and we've allowed that to stay in a natural state. Uh, we've never altered it. Um, so I'd like to kind of get into what I'd like to talk to you about today is the important role that private landowners have in stewarding working lands. Prior to European settlement in the Great Plains, bison played an until recently misunderstood role in the benefits that they create to grassland health. Today's cattle ranches fill that role along with native ungul ungulates such as deer, pronghorn, and elk. Without all these animals grazing native grasses, the health of the grass species deteriorates to a monoculture environment, destroying the habitat that biodiversity needs for all species. Research shows that responsible cattle grazing has an enormous benefit on native plants and diversity that otherwise would not be possible. These animals are upcyclers of a natural resource that would otherwise not be utilized, forages that are not available for human consumption. But the beef production on our ranch allows those forages to be put into a nutrient-dense product that helps feed the world. We began a herd of purebred limousine cattle in the 1970s, and to this day, every cow on our ranch goes back to one heifer calf that was born in 1971. Because of this, the cattle that graze our ranch today are uniquely adapted to the environment they live in. We began selling purebred seed stock 45 years ago and sell cattle into Mexico, across the United States, and into Canada. Our cattle are extremely important to us and the source of our passion and livelihoods. The cattle are handled every day by horseback, so the same goes for the horses that are on our ranch, how important all of those animals are to us. So now I'm going to tell you what I believe is the most valuable set of animals on our ranch, and that's the amazing resilient beavers that have protected this ranch since God created it. Without beavers working to protect our stream bed and grasslands, we more than likely would have long ago been forced to sell all the cattle, the horses, and some of the driest of years. We've been in the throes of severe drought since 2002. Um, Sand Creek begins just outside Car Springs, I said, and flows along and drains towards the Arkansas River. A few de decades ago, when it was a stream with surface flow, most of the track it, it was flowing continually, but today it only has those alluvial deposits which provide important pools in buffalo wallows and other lonely areas to provide life-saving water for all species, plants, animals, and insects which provide the biodiversity that is needed in all walks of life. We, uh, we have many beaver lodges in the stream bed of Big Sandy Creek that have been inhabited for my entire life. Through all types of adversity, droughts have literally dried the surrounding landscape completely. Human attempts to trap, poison, dynamite their lodges and dams, and the inevitable natural predators that are constantly present, they're continue doing their job to create protect the environment that they live in. Sometime, some people have a hard time believing that the beaver can exist, let alone thrive in the absence of trees. They are herbivores and as you can see, do quite well in treeless prairie ecosystems and have done so from the beginning of creation. One of the many benefits that beavers provide is open water. That allows waterfowl to have a layover in their migration. On many days in the fall and then in, again in the spring, there are thousands upon thousands of waterfowl that call the ranch home, literally covering every open area of water. In addition to the wetland areas of the Creek Valley, we also have a reservoir and that provides more nesting habitat. Because of the existence of beavers in this ecosystem, we have had numerous species that are threatened and in dangers and are thriving in the system. The ranch is the only native grass that connects Colorado's two populations of lesser prairie chickens and listed as critical habitat. 
the marshes in the valley are spring fed and support one of the largest breeding populations of the recently listed endangered black rail birds, commonly known as the ghost birds because they're rarely seen. As many of you are aware, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the last two years has listed 23 species and declared them extinct. Without protection, species such as the black rails, lesser prairie chickens, burrowing owls, um, mountain plovers, piping plovers, all of those will be the next ones on the extinction list. We have thousands of burrowing owls on the ranch and prairie dog colonies. And because of those, we have uh, last three years have re released black-footed ferrets on the ranch and trying to establish natural populations of those. The stream and beaver dams, the stream because of the beaver dams contain one of the largest, healthiest populations of Arkansas darter fish known, which are only in a small area in Southeast Colorado. All of this is thanks to the remarkable beaver. We operate the ranch in a totally natural system. We do not poison, trap, or kill any animals. We allow them to be in their natural state. In over 40 years and tens of thousands of calves being born on the ranch, we have not had one case of calf being killed due to predation. The coyotes that inhabit the ranch have been intact for decades and function within their natural prey system. We, we believe that if we let biodiversity take its course, that things will balance themselves out. One, one thing that probably is um, something that most people don't hear ranchers say, but we a few years ago, we did two years of surveys with Denver Botanical Gardens, and we surveyed and documented the plants on the ranch. Uh, they came up with over two years, they'd come out every three months and spend days walking the ranch. Over 335 species of native plants on the ranch. So one example I like to use is there is one plant called Wright's False Willow. Wright's False Willow has to have a specific set of conditions before it can survive. And it is only in those places that it can be. Also Wright's False Willow is the only known host plant for painted grasshopper nymphs. So I'm a rancher and I'm promoting grasshoppers, but I will say this, the importance of those painted grasshoppers is they keep other species of grasshoppers in balance and in check. And as long as all species are in, in place and that chain of biodiversity is intact, those, those systems do not get out of balance. We've had many, many times over the last few years that we've been asked to eradicate the beaver on the ranch. The reason that we, we have always um, refused this, we've never allowed anybody to affect what God has created is because those beavers were here on this landscape before anybody else showed up. The beaver created the system that we have and our challenge is to keep that from being destroyed. So over the years, as, as we have worked with different agencies to try, to try to make it to where we could coexist, Colorado has a very, as I'm sure most Western states, complex set of water laws. And Colorado and Kansas have an interstate compact that Colorado is required to deliver a certain amount of flow to the state line. So over the years, we've had a lot of pressure to allow different agencies to come in and drain our wetlands in order to provide more water flow to the state line. Always we have resisted that. And thankfully, after more of the very people who are on this call today, more of that narrative gets out there, people start to understand that these stream bed systems, these natural networks of beaver complexes contribute greatly to what we're all working towards. One quick example I'll give is this past summer, we had epic rains up along the front range. Colorado Springs, especially in two weeks time, they received over five inches of rain twice. This created a flash flood that was coming down Sand Creek. I didn't think I would ever see a flash flood on Sand Creek again in my life because of the development that has happened on all of it. But in two days, that flash flood actually reached our fence line. So it went about 180 miles in two or three days, and it was coming at a very rapid rate. It was carrying sediment, um, a lot of debris, anything that could wash, and because most of the stream north of us is an incised stream channel. So as that hit our north property line and it started to hit the beaver complexes, 
that water dispersed. And in some places it got to the point that the water across our stream valley was a mile wide rather than the 100 feet wide that it entered our property on. So the, the water became a mile wide over all of these emergent wetlands. And what took, it took two and a half days to get to our ranch in 180 miles, it took two and a half days to get seven miles from our north end to the Arkansas River. Once it reached the Arkansas River, it was no longer sediment filled water that was carrying trash and flood debris. It was clear, clean water that entered the river in that state. So that's the importance of beaver and how agriculture can work with beaver. And I, I'll continually promote that. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to people who have the same kindred spirit. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Dallas. And just want to note um, in the chat box, just the amount of um, love that you're getting on this Valentine's Day for speaking here. And um, just uh, a lot of appreciation for the stewardship that you're doing. And uh, just uh, the the whole chat box is a, a li a lighting up with love. Um, and just really quickly before I move on, I do want to uh, address a question with you. Um, you mentioned that um, you don't have many trees on your property. So this question is what do beaver eat without trees and what materials do they use to create dams without trees? Uh, great question. The beaver, and I say we don't have any trees. We have a few, as you see behind me. And I'll mention that those trees are no longer here today because two years ago we had a massive wildfire. All of the trees you see behind me are gone today. We hope that willows and cottonwoods will reestablish. We're working on that now. But they never were much of a factor because they're not close to the stream bed. So our beaver, and it amazed me when we began this work years ago, a lot of people, even that are highly involved in beaver work, um, were amazed to find out that most of our beavers can't even spell tree. They don't know what a tree is. So our beavers use sedges, bulrushes, and cattails, and that's what they build all their dams with, all their lodges with. So there's not even a tree branch in any of those. But what was amazing is after the fire, the fire was so intense that it literally burnt it, all of the forage, even the sedges, bulrushes, and cattails off the top of the water. It was an absolute moonscape. My fear, of course, was the fact that we would lose our beaver, that they would be gone. If any of them survived the fire, they would not be able to survive because the creek literally dried up after the fire. And that we were afraid that they would be, if not extirpate, ex extirpated, they would have to leave. What we found out was those beaver, and I say resilient a lot, and it's absolutely the truth, those beaver began digging and inhabiting dirt burrows in the stream bank. They literally lived in the dirt until finally this past summer, water has raised to the level where they have began rebuilding their lodges and dams. And their dams and lodges are built out of solely bulrushes, cattails, and mud. And that's all. Wow. Thank you, Dallas. And then one more question before we, we move on to John. Can you um, repeat the size of your ranch and tell us um, what is occupied by cattle and what is occupied by wetlands? We have, the ranch is about 17,000 acres of grass total, and we have 4,000 acres of emergent wetlands. So the 4,000 acres of emergent wetlands run from north to south, a seven mile stretch of the creek. And we kind of use that in a different way. We never fence it off. Our cattle have access to those riparian areas and stream beds nonstop. We've never done that. We believe putting a fence in creates a natural, unnatural traffic pattern. So out of about 17,000 acres, we have 13,000 acres of grass that the cattle really work on, but they also work through the wetlands in a natural way. Oh. Thank you, Dallas. Our farm, our farm operation is separate from that. We farm about 4,000 acres of irrigated alfalfa and corn, which is contiguous to the ranch, but actually not part of the working, the cattle part of the ranch. Gotcha. Great. Thank you so much, Dallas. And now um, I'm going to hand the mic over to John um, to, to share with us um, his experiences. Thank you, Adam. Are, will you be able to put up the... Yes, I think everybody's got it right there. Yep. There we go. Thank you. 
great to be with you all and, and really, really inspired by the folks before me. It's really awesome. I am John Griggs. I'm the ranch manager for Maggie Creek Ranch, which is about halfway between Reno, Nevada and Salt Lake City along Interstate 80 in the northeast corner of Nevada, just outside of the town of Elko. I got two, two maps here, both of the same place. Maggie Creek Ranch, the headquarters units of roughly 200,000 acres of public and private. The map to your left is shows the public overlay in yellow. A lot of that's in checkerboard left over from what the federal government gave to, to the railroads when they built the railroads out west. They gave every other section in checkerboard fashion for a 20-mile swath. And I think they did that to make management of both public and private every bit as difficult as possible. But, but the, so you can see there inside the, inside that red border is roughly uh, a third to a half public lands. In our case, managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And the map map on the right is the same map. It gives you a little little idea of the topography. Maggie Creek runs right up the west side of the ranch and then into the heart of the ranch at the, at the top end. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Susie Creek, which runs right through the middle of the ranch. Um, if you'd advance the slides, please, please, Adam. We are, we are a high desert operation, a uh, sagebrush step. This picture was probably in May, um, about as good as it looks here as far as green and green grass. About an eight to 10 inch precip zone, and most of that comes in snow. So most of the year we're pretty dry, and, and most of the year we are not green. Um, we are a cow calf and stalker operation, you know, cow calf being the first step in beef production. And then we consider it a ranch, not a farm, in that, in that our climate's not suitable to really farm anything. We don't, we're not able to grow crops here. Uh, our cattle, our cattle graze out on the on the rangelands, and we run a Angus Angus cross cow, a smaller sort of a smaller frame cow, very well adapted for our environment. Go ahead, Adam, please. So this is Susie Creek, and this picture was taken in the early late eighties, early nineties, and it's probably. It's probably Carol Evans' picture. And Carol, I saw you're joining us today. That's awesome. Carol is, is or was a fisheries biologist for the Bureau of Land Management, and she is our partner in a lot of what we've done here. And probably half the pictures you're going to see were hers. But, but so this is Susie Creek, as I said, her late 80s, early 90s. And this is when I came to be employed by Maggie Creek Ranch in 1991. This is what I remember of Susie Creek. Except that in the in the summer, in the hot part of the year, this would be dry. So what you would see then is no water and all gravel. And think about that as far as what good is that to anybody? Not not much use to the stockman for sure. Not much use to fish, obviously. Not much use to wildlife. Not not really much good to anybody. But this this is how it was when I came. And so Carol, in conjunction with the ma manager before me, uh, got together and decided to try to make some changes to, to benefit this riparian area. And really, the, to put it basically, is to not graze this system during the hot season every year. And so they figured out how to do that a lot with fencing, but also with herding and other methods. And changes happen pretty fast. And um, go ahead, Adam, please. Changes happen pretty fast. We got uh, we got uh, riparian vegetation within five years, and then we started to get willows along with that. And then the star of our show, this guy showed up. These these guys showed up. And then and then things really got dynamic when beaver entered the system and it's i think important to note that that historically in nevada along with not understanding how to graze our environment 
we also trapped beaver nearly out of existence in Nevada, which, which, you know, I don't, I don't have to tell you how damaging that was. I don't think, but, but it really was. And so when we, when we got the habitat, right, these guys moved in, uh, I, I think from a nearby stream, Maggie Creek, which, which had a little bit of beaver, but, but not a whole lot. We had to, we had to fix things over there as well. But these guys move in, and I think it was I think it was Leslie that talked about beaver, the risks they would take on open ground. And I think these guys, I think, came in overland from Maggie Creek. I don't Maggie Creek and Susie Creek are both tributaries of the Humboldt River, but I don't think they they went down Maggie Creek up the Humboldt and up Susie Creek. I think they came overland, which which if you think about high desert and beavers trotting along a- across mountain ranges to get to here, it's, pr- it's pretty phenomenal. But so when they came, they, they did phenomenal things. They do what they do. They, as, as, as uh, Leslie and Allison said, you can't, you can't outwork a beaver. They, they slowed the water down. They spread it out. They created places that we didn't have, have anymore. Next slide, please. So this is the same place as the late 80s, early 90s picture. And this is this is obviously after beaver, after we got the grazing correct and beaver entered the system and they created a place like this. And so now um, the benefits should be obvious. You know, we have we have water from cut bank to cut bank and we have um, good habitat for about anything that wants to come to Nevada. And we have pretty good cow habit, habitat too. We have, we have green forage available at a time when green forage is not available range wide. But most importantly, when you think about Nevada and you think about the driest state in the union, we do have drought. And, and so an eight to 10 inch precip zone, what does that mean exactly? What does that mean for stockmen? How do you know when you're in drought when you're only getting eight, eight inches of rainfall a year, precipitation a year annually? Well, f- well, for a stockman, it means that we don't have stock water. We don't have water available for our cattle to drink. We almost always have grass, some kind of forage, even in a drought year. But a lot of times in drought, we will not have stock water for our cows to drink. And so... In, in uh, say, 1920, 21, 22, really severe drought in Nevada. A lot of, a lot of herds depopulating in Nevada because, and, and ours included, because of drought and because of the lack of stock water. We have places like this, which is, which is really, really pretty beneficial, as you can imagine, really pretty phenomenal. And, and to Dallas's point, this dam in the foreground here is, is um, constructed a lot from, from, uh, from uh, cattails and bulrushes. And in our case, mostly our, beaver, our beavers like willows. And when they, when they get ahead of the willows, when they, when they um, use the willow so much and graze them, graze them down or if we get a flood event that, that takes out willows, our beavers will move on to a place that hasn't. They don't, they, they will build dams out of cattails, but, but for the most part, they, they don't like it. They'll move on to a place that does have willows and then come back when the willows come back. I think that's, Adam, that's all my slides, isn't it? I think I'll I think I'll stop there. Um, that that gives you an overview of what we're doing, and I'd be happy to field any questions or or turn it over to the group. Thank you so much, John. You know, a question that came up, but that maybe each of you can answer. This can be how we can jump into this open conversation portion. Is um, how many families of beavers do we all think you have on your properties? And we'll start with Allison, then go to Dallas, and then John. Uh, we just have one family. Um, it's a, it's 
the the population of that one lodge has gone up and down up to five or six at one time but right now i think we're at three or four and we have much smaller we're, we're we have a much smaller piece of property yeah <laughs> i feel pretty puny now um <laughs> But yeah, and, and the stream is so small, but it's just, just one. And there's really not room for there to be more than one. In 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 some ways, it's really kind of, uh, it's not a one property here. This is not, uh, uh, in terms of other places they could be, this is this is kind of the the fringe of the, the real estate market. Yeah. Our, but they're making it work. We have neighbor, we have neighbor beavers. Yeah. They live on neighboring property. Yeah. This stream goes downstream and there are other beavers not too far away. If if we could have draw a two hundred thousand acre circle, we would have many, 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 many beaver families. And Dallas, how about you? I would guess I don't know how to estimate beaver families, but I would I would say we have in the neighborhood thirty beaver dams, and I don't know how that relates to how many families. I I could count probably ten to fifteen lodges. So that's probably a better indicator of families. I'd say we probably have 10 to 15. Uh, we lost some of those in the fire. I think that we're building back though, and hopefully those will fill back in. Okay. And, and John? Gosh, I I can't I can't answer. We we have we have probably seven or eight miles of Susie Creek and and maybe 15, 20 miles of Maggie Creek and uh, seven or eight miles along the Humboldt River, and there's there's beaver and all of it, and they they wax and wane sort of in in population with with all the challenges we have with drought and fire and and flood and freezing and other f words that that I don't it, it's hard to keep up with, but we have a lot. I actually had a question directly for you, uh, John. Here on Maggie Ranch, was there any active management of the stream system? Excuse me, stream system beyond the change in grazing, any structures or planting? Uh, we have a we have a an irrigation diversion set up on Maggie Creek that that Carol Evans, as I said, who's who's in here today, I think. Uh, we worked with Carol and and. Partners for Fish and Wildlife with an with a Fish and Wildlife Service to change that diversion to make it a fish friendly passage, and still be a diversion. Um, other than that, no beaver beaver have done their own thing, and and we're happy to have let them. We haven't had to we haven't done beaver dam analogs or haven't had to do much else besides that. That's great. This one's for uh, for everyone, um, so feel free to to pop in. Um, have any of you had any run-ins from neighbors or community members who don't like beavers or are convinced they mean trouble? This is this is more of a human-human coexistence uh, uh, challenge, right, that we're wanting to address. So uh, feel free to jump in if anyone has anything they'd like to share. I, I will go ahead, Adam. I, I have not had direct problems because, as I said, the north of me, there's no stream flow on the on the creek. It's not really habitat for beaver. I suppose before my time, there were confrontations, and that's probably part of the reason that the beaver aren't there. I contend if the beaver would have been left alone and not viewed as a, a trouble for the current landowner, they would have created these networks of wetlands up above, and people would have more likely seen the benefit of them, but there was too much of the mindset that they were they were extracting resources from the landscape rather than people re extracting resources, which is a problem. The beaver don't extract resources, they add to it greatly. So I can't really comment on, a, on my neighbors and how that is. I will I will give you one anecdote. Um I'm on the I'm on the Car Parks and Wildlife Commission. And so because of that, I get a lot of inquiries. And just recently, <clears throat> there is another area in our part of the state that has water crossing the road now because beaver are on one of the few creeks in this area. Beaver are creating an area to where it's kind of backing up to that. And so now we're being asked, how are we going to deal with that as far as parks and wildlife 
or the local county road and bridge department. And hopefully, we haven't got into that too much, but hopefully flow control devices or beaver receivers, which we've used some on the ranch also, will be able to come up with some, some ideas and people see that there really is resolution of these problems other than just eradication of the beaver. I would say that um, the beavers don't rep recognize property lines, right? So some of our beaver habitat spills over right into our neighbor's property and then curls back around into our property. And um, I think it's been one of our fears that one of our neighbors would take action against the beavers. There's, It's actually against the law in Massachusetts to um, trap and kill beavers without a specific, you know, license and reason related to them being a nuisance like they're flooding your they're flooding your farm fields or your you know that sort of thing so there are some restrictions about what people can do and local conservation laws also prevent people from tearing out their dams it's actually illegal to do that so um, we had some trouble with one neighbor who was tearing out a dam that wasn't even on his property it also was not on our property um, so we just notified our local conservation commission who had a conversation with him and he stopped doing it. We um, hope, we hope. I think, he was, I think he was just doing it because he's just a guy who had to mess with things. And, uh, you know, I think by and large, like I say, there, this is a, unlike out West, there are a lot of people, even though this is a rural area, we are close to one another. There are a lot of roadways and driveways and culverts. This is, and so beavers, I mean. And slope, we have elevation change that you may not have so much in Colorado. So if you tear out a beaver dam up on a hill here, um, you're letting loose thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of water, which is essentially a flash flood. Um, and when our neighbor did do that, it, it this stream leaves our property, hooks around and comes back in. He tore out the dam and when he tore it out, all that water came through and it took out bridges that we had down below. And it it might have threatened actually the road, the next roadway and the culvert that the thing goes under. I don't think he was really thinking that through. Um, Which is why the Conservation Commission guy went to him and said, he can't do that. So I think one of the things, of, the other thing I like about the Beaver Institute and Mike is he actually did a, a training with... Um, DPW. The, the local departments of public works to, and they came to our property and showed how our flow devices uh, work to try to get more of the small towns here to stop using the killing of beavers as the first resort when um, culverts get plugged, as they do, right? Just up the road from us is a, a beaver dam very close to a culvert under a state highway. So it's it's nice to be able to to be in, serve as an example of how we can live peacefully with these creatures. And I think what he's showing those departments is that it's actually more cost efficient to have a flow control device rather than paying people to kill the beavers and then kill them again and then kill them again when they come back or pay guys to once a week go and rip out dams that just get rebuilt. Right. Because the beavers are going to come. We have a big population of beavers here and it's just growing. And I think that um, we've just got to learn to make make peace with them. And I would also say that one of the things I really appreciated about our beavers this year, last year we had no rain or in 2022. And this past growing season in 2023, we had way too much rain. There was a lot of flooding, a lot of farmers who um, grow their crops along rivers, had their crops wiped out. We were very fortunate in that we are one level above the rivers, but the beavers, their dams and waterways slowed the flow of water through our property. So instead of just a torrential blast of what could happen when you get six inches of rain in a couple hours, it was a slow, a slow movement of that water as right. it made its way through our property. So it didn't blow out our roads culvert right. as it has in the this, past. This July, we had one day with 10 inches of rain just upstream from here. And it destroyed a lot of roads in neighboring towns, but it 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 was mitigated by our beaver dam system on a very small scale compared to you guys. But it's still, we have on this little piece of property, probably 12 different dams. It's like the Erie Canal, step by step by step by step. They've got this dam so that it, it slows all of that flow. Thank you, Alison. Yes, I think we're, we're pretty fortunate. Our, our neighbors are all on board with, with beaver. 
Hmm. But Nevada is the driest state in the union. We say whiskey is for drinking, water's for fighting. All of the water <laughs> in Nevada, <laughs> all the water in Nevada, above ground or below ground, is adjudicated, meaning it all belongs to somebody, all belongs to the state. And, and with the right, you're able to use it. And there are cases where, where some folks see water impounded, but we're not allowed to impound water without a right. And, and there are cases where below stream neighbors see upstream neighbors impounding water with beaver and think, hey, that's my water. But more and more people under, are understanding the, the hydrology of it, that you know when you flood the sponge, then the, then the sponge carries water, not absorbs water. And, and it means more water, not less. Thank you, John. Uh, we have another question from someone who grew up on the Canadian prairies, wondering if someone can comment on whether they have any stories or insight about beavers benefiting large grain farms. We don't have large grain farms in this part of the country. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's been really interesting to hear the different diversity of, of what you're growing and dealing with, though, but perhaps not specifically grain. That's OK. <laughs> we do have some more questions uh, flooding in. Actually, one that was missed earlier uh, for, for Allison and Leslie regarding uh, you had mentioned your dog. Um, and what, has there ever been any interaction between beaver and dog? And how does that go? Well, probably like a lot of people, we don't really go anywhere on the farm without our dogs. So, yeah, um, there's never been any trouble. Um, usually if if the dogs are close to the beavers, the beavers will slap their tail and scoot away and, and it's not a problem. They're, as I say, our beavers are pretty used to seeing people and things and they know how to navigate that. I don't think they want to mess with any dumb dogs and, you know. And our dogs are just not that predatory. I mean, we're not talking about Jack Russells or some other kind of really predatory yeah. dog here. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest predator that we have, and I wonder if you guys, well, you guys might have some bigger predators, but um, bobcats are probably... And coyotes. And, yeah, but I, more bobcats yeah. are a, a bigger threat to the beaver population, especially the young beavers yeah. in um, you know July and August when the young ones are just coming out of the lodge and and hanging out for the first time uh, wildlife cameras have shown us that uh, this is a time of year that bobcats come and hang out on dams and will sit for hours at a spillway on a dam just waiting for something to come by and and uh, I, I i do have footage of a bobcat capturing a beaver that way but that's a good thing i mean you know you can have too many beavers and this stuff all balances itself out and yeah. bobcats are a good thing and they have to eat too yeah but I don't know. I, I assume mountain lions might do the same thing in the Rockies. I, I don't know. It's a good meal if you can catch one. Yeah, we, we've had beavers die here, and I actually weighed one of ours because I was curious what it weighed. It came in at 44 pounds. So it's a, a, a pretty large animal. As I mean, certainly weighs much more than a bobcat or a coyote or, you know, the only thing really bigger than that weighs more than a beaver here is a bear. Well, it seems like you've captured some pretty amazing stuff on those wildlife cameras of yours. <laughs> we, can't put it, we can't put it on Facebook because it's kind of in the sort of upsetting department. So that's the kind of thing we don't show. Well, you had some other lovely photos as well. <laughs> um, another question here. Has anyone tried a berm between a pond uh, and infrastructure instead of a flow device to protect a road or trail or field? Um, I will say this, like John in Colorado, almost all of our water is over appropriated and we have the same problems with impoundment of water as a matter of fact the state of Colorado division of water resources has to watch that there is pond enforcement but there's not water being captured and impounded without a water right um thankfully colorado res recognizes the fact that you can hold water for livestock to drink but then there are limits to that um, certain sizes so we, you know, we haven't done anything outside of flow control or beaver deceiver devices because that would constitute 
an impoundment of water that wouldn't naturally be there. So I don't think that would be accepted in Colorado. There's there's some new work going on for some stream grid stream bed restoration projects to be allowed in Colorado. And that's a work in progress. And I think like John said, a great analogy that once you wet the sponge, that sponge stays wet and that water, it lags to the rivers or stream beds in a controlled manner. And I think there just has to be some education done on things like that. Thank you for that insight, Dallas. I, I'd speak to that generally. Uh, the, the thing to remember when you're, when you're trying to dissuade a beaver is that you cannot work a beaver. You will go every day. If you're going to unplug a culvert, you will go every day and you won't be there enough. So, so the remedy, the remedy has to bear that in mind and it has to be reasonably simple and it has to be, uh, it has to it has to be where where a beaver just doesn't want to do it, and I, I tend to think of a culvert as a as a lazy beaver at work, you know, or, or a smart beaver, however you want to work it, however you want to think about it. But but a culvert has already done part of the work of the of the beaver, and and you know, part part of the system is dammed off. The the thing that the thing that you want to think about, I think, with to dissuade a beaver is is to make it harder for that beaver that that wants to take push the easy button and 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 also think of it, you know, as cost effective too, where a bunch of dirt work, you know, if you put a bunch of time into a bunch of dirt work and with equipment and and you know a beaver comes along that evening and 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 does what you've done, you know, you can throw big pots of money trying to undo beaver and, and not be successful. So, I, I would say to add on, John, um, Leslie and Allison showed a photograph of one of their flow control devices. And those panels we've, we've implemented in several places that have, have a real high potential for the beaver to come in and dam off a culvert. And in years, we've never had one fail. I mean, it's amazing how well they've worked, but we've never had one fail. Well, in our last remaining minutes here, I, I would like to turn things over to you all now that you've kind of heard uh, the varying diverse stories. Uh, I was wondering, do you have any questions uh, for each other? I'll jump in one more time at the risk of speaking too much, but I, I had received the question about our riparian areas, that we do not keep the cattle out of our riparian areas. And we're in a unique situation where after our fire a year ago, we lost 42 miles of fence. We literally have no fences through our creek bed, through the whole stream system. We have zero fences. But what that has really shown us, we were in an intensive grazing situation before that, which we have lost the ability to do that because of that. But our cattle in the last two years have had the ability to traverse the whole ranch at different times of year that they want to go. And what's been re become really obvious, the cattle do not want to be in those marshes, riparian areas, streams in the in the months that um the insects are able to have them because it's just not worth them. It's too much pressure. I think it's by God's design actually that it happens, but the cattle don't want to be in those riparian areas. They will go in there after the a killing frost and that is, but they don't go in there and want to be in that area too much. They kind of work the, work the hillsides. So as we've gotten in more into that and I believe in the natural mimicry, I just think that's the way it was designed to, Bison inhabited those stream beds and riparian areas for centuries upon centuries, and they're still there today. And the only challenge to them has been man's development. So I think that we're working on that, but I don't see, unless there's really intensive pressure on your riparian areas, and we operate the ranch in a way that we try to coexist. 
we run many fewer animal units than we could actually put on the ranch. So there's not high pressure and a high propensity for the cattle to have to go to those riparian areas to forage. Hey, I noticed, I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Leslie. Um, I noticed there was a question on there for us about um, whether the beavers had tried to block our um, flow devices. And I just wanted to say that there was an attempt only this year on one of the older devices to put some mud around the kits. Why the big cages are there is to keep the beavers from getting to that, the opening of the, the um, intake, the intake uh, for the water. And otherwise, and Mike has even come out and looked at them again with us and because um, he lives local to us, so we're lucky. And <laughs> and looked at them and felt like they were still in good condition 10 years later. So um, we've not had a lot of trouble with the beavers messing with our devices, but I understand that that happens for some people. And it's a I think when you install them, you have to understand that you're going to have to manage them because you have to keep an eye on what the beavers are doing and the truth is I'm in my blueberry patches basically every day. So I see my flow devices almost every day. Well, thank you so much, um, Allison, Leslie, Dallas, John, um, for your time and sharing your stories and experiences with Beaver. Um, this has been amazing and I've learned so much and I just can't wait um, to share this webinar with the rest of the world. I'm sure it's gonna get many, many views. Um, there's been a lot of love coming at all of you for, for the work that you're doing in the chat. So I hope that you feel that. And just wanna also put a word in um, for our next webinar, which will be a two-parter um, on beaver and bison. Our first part will be on March 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern, um, where we will have Beaver Wetland Professional and Beaver Corps member, Allison Delgizzi, who works in Western Colorado, focusing on low-tech process-based restoration of riverscapes and beaver mimicry, excuse me, beaver biomimicry. And we'll also have Peter Bick, a documentary filmmaker and professor whose work focus on, focuses on, among other things, bison biomimicry. So that's gonna be a really dynamic uh, conversation about um, where beaver and bi bison biomimicry might align. And uh, I'm particularly excited for that. We have a link here that we're gonna put into the chat so you can register uh, and stay tuned for information on the second part of the beaver and bison webinar series. Um, we're, going, we're very close to finalizing part two. Um, also, be on the lookout. I saw someone say that uh, we should have y'all present at BeaverCon, um, but be on the lookout for information on BeaverCon, which is going to be in Boulder, Colorado at the university there um, from October 20th to 23rd. We're releasing our request for proposals next week, so be on the lookout for that. And also, registration will be opening in April. And then uh, finally, last um, but not least, if y'all love what you're doing and you want to show the love on this Valentine's Day, um, please consider making a donation so we can continue offering these services and public programming such as this. So if you appreciate it, feel free to show us some love. And otherwise, uh, we're really grateful for your presence and grateful for our panelists. And we will see you next month with Beaver and Bison. Uh, have a lovely Valentine's Day. And again, thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>